Welcome back to Exploring the New Testament. Today, we will be looking at the Gospel according to Matthew, which obviously was written by Matthew, who was one of Jesus' disciples. He was a tax collector, also went by the name Levi, and, um, and he left his tax booth to follow Jesus. And now, uh, all those years later, he's writing down a lot of the things that he witnessed himself Jesus teaching and Jesus doing. His uh, audience, his target audience, may be uh, non-Christian Jews. And the reason for this is that he's going to really emphasize the Old Testament. So it makes sense that he might be writing about the fulfillment of uh, Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament in order to prove to these non-Christian Jews that Jesus is the Messiah they've been looking for. He probably wrote from either Judah or uh, Galilee, uh, so from the Promised Land, the, the land of Israel, which makes sense uh, if he's writing to Jewish people. And then uh, he is writing maybe around 60 to 65 AD, which is about 30 years after the death of Jesus. Now, if we look at the structure of the book, there's kind of an introduction and a conclusion. The introduction in 1 to 4 is how the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. So there we have the birth of Jesus. We have the baptism of Jesus, his temptation. And then the final chapters, 26 to 28, is how King Jesus receives all authority. So he receives authority by being crucified and raised. And then because he has that authority, he's going to extend his kingdom to all nations. But the main body of the book is chapters 5 to 25, where Jesus proclaims the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew organizes his gospel around five sermons or teachings um, that, that Jesus uh, gives in his gospel. Number one is what we normally call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I call it life in the kingdom of heaven. The second one is Jesus sends out the disciples with authority. Number three, Jesus reveals the kingdom in parables. Number four, life together in the kingdom of heaven. And number five, which is often called the Olivet Discourse because it was given on the Mount of Olives, uh, the coming of the kingdom in power. And in between each of these sets of teachings is a set of stories that emphasize one or two main points that helped to progress the story of Jesus. Now, what are some of the main emphases of Matthew? The first one, which is impossible to miss, is that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Time and time again, Matthew is saying, this happened to fulfill what was written by the prophets. This is what happened to fulfill what was written by the prophet uh, Isaiah. He's wanting to make clear Jesus is, is doing the things that the Old Testament said he would do. Now, in Matthew 13, verse 52, Jesus says that every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his store, storeroom treasures new and old. Matthew, I think, sees himself as this disciple. His gospel comes first in the New Testament because he focuses on how the old treasures... The, the treasures from the Old Testament and the new treasures, the treasures from the New Testament, fit together. He's bringing out of the storeroom both of these treasures and showing them to us um, that Jesus is the one who fulfills all the expectations God gave his people in the Old Testament. And of course, that expectation was that Jesus would be the king of his people. Matthew begins with a genealogy showing that Jesus comes from the line of King David. Uh, he shows Jesus uh, preaching that the kingdom of God has come near. And um, ultimately, after his resurrection, Jesus is going to say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is the king that the Jewish people have been waiting for to bring about the kingdom of God. And as the king, he's also a wise teacher. That's the ideal Jewish king. That's what David was, that's what Solomon was. And so that's why Matthew records these five sermons that we just went over in the outline 
uh, that, that organize his entire book. Jesus is a wise teacher, a new Moses, a new David, a new Solomon, that's going to show us how to live in God's kingdom. And, and then we are going to be given the commission to make disciples of all nations doing what? Teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. And that's how the gospel ends. That's Matthew's final emphasis, to make disciples of all nations. So let me read that whole passage, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age." Jesus wants his kingdom to spread to the entire world, to every people group and every language. And the task of the church today is to take the gospel to all people, to make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them and teaching them so that Jesus' kingdom, which has authority over all nations, not just the Jewish people, but all heaven and all earth, that that kingdom would be spread to the ends of the earth. Today we want to talk about the gospel according to Mark, which was probably the first of the four gospels that were written. We typically believe that Mark was the first, and then Matthew and Luke, who are the other two of the three synoptic gospels, that they borrowed a lot of the material from Mark. So we, we kind of date Mark as being written between 55 and 60. And Mark was um, an assistant to Peter. He shows up in the New Testament a few times, uh, but he is an assistant to Peter. And, and some of the early Christians said he was like Peter's translator, especially when he went to Rome, where Peter would have needed to preach in Latin instead of in Greek or Aramaic. And that as he's translating from Peter and telling all the stories that Peter is telling, that he's starting to write down these stories from Peter's perspective. So he's probably writing these things down in Rome shortly before uh, Peter's uh, death uh, in the final days and ministry of Peter. And he's telling these things to Gentile Christians in the churches that are in Rome. And probably it's Gentile Christians because every now and then he has to explain some of the Jewish customs to his readers. Now, the main idea of the book is that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God who came to die for sin. He's totally focused on who Jesus is and why Jesus came. That's the two parts of the book from uh, chapter 1 to 8.26 focuses on the question, who is Jesus? And the answer is the Messiah. In chapter 8, verse 27, to the end of the book, chapter 16, why did Jesus come? And the answer is he came to die. So at the center of that in Mark 8, 27 to 30, is when Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some of you think you're, you're Elijah or another prophet who's come back, and then Jesus says, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? So that's the question of the entire gospel. Who do we say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus? And Mark has already answered that question in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, when he says that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He says Jesus is the Christ, He's the Messiah. That's what the, the word Christ means in Greek. The anointed king that God promised to send to the people of Israel. But he's also the son of God. And we see both of those answers coming up in the story of Mark itself. When Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? In Mark chapter 8, Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And that's the correct answer. Jesus is the one who has come to establish the kingdom of God, who's the king that God has appointed. But he's not just the Messiah. He's also 
the Son of God? And we see that answer to the question in Mark chapter 15, verse 39. There's a Roman centurion standing beside the cross, and when he sees how Jesus has died, he says, truly this man was the Son of God. Both of those answers are needed to fully understand who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah, he's the King, but he's also the Son of God. Now, why has he come? Jesus has come to die. That's why he's come. He's come to give his life for his people. Let's read uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus taught that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. Three times Jesus is going to predict to his disciples, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be raised from the dead from the dead. And and the disciples wrestle with this. They don't understand that Jesus is the king who has come to die. Their their minds can't wrap around that. They think of kings in a different mindset. They think of the king of Israel as coming to conquer rather than to sacrifice himself. And they have to understand the nature of what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. He's not the Messiah they're expecting. He's the Messiah that God has sent. And um, and discipleship is what is all about making that comprehension of who Jesus is as Messiah. That's uh, all throughout the book, 16 chapters of Mark. One of the emphases is on being a disciple, following Jesus, So Jesus calls these first disciples with the simple call, follow me. And they leave everything to follow Jesus and become a disciple. Uh, They have to deny themselves. To be a disciple, you have to take up your cross, Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, and follow him. He demands that we give everything to follow him. Why? Because that's the nature of his messiahship. He is the type of Messiah that gives his own life for the world. And so if we are going to be disciples of this Messiah, then we're going to give our lives for him. So Mark is giving us this picture of who Jesus is, why he has come, and what it means to follow him. Luke was a physician and a co-laborer with Paul. He was one of the, the guys who made, part, made up uh, Paul's missionary team. And um, he set forth to be kind of the historian of the early church uh, by writing a gospel that patterned itself after early historians, early Greek and Roman historians, to really give historical validity to the good news of Jesus Christ and the early Christian movement. He writes his his gospel to a man named Theophilus, who may not, that may not have been his real name, because it's a name that simply means lover of God. Um, But he is a man who's probably the sponsor of Luke in writing his gospel. It's very expensive to do research, to to write and, and use even the materials to write a book in this day. So so there would be wealthy patrons who would enable this. And so Theophilus is that sponsor. But Luke is obviously writing to people beyond Theophilus as well. He's writing to other Gentile Christians, probably writing in either Rome or in Greece from about uh, AD 60 to AD 62. And his main emphasis is that Jesus is the spirit-filled man who saves all nations through his death and resurrection. So uh, we begin the Gospel of Luke in chapters 1 through 4 with Jesus coming into the world. It's one of the two Gospels that actually tell about the birth of Jesus. And then uh, chapters 4 to 9, Jesus ministers in Galilee by the Spirit's power. Chapter 9 to 19, Jesus determines to journey to Jerusalem. Chapters 19 to 21, Jesus judges the powerful in Jerusalem. And then 22 to 24, Jesus is crucified and resurrected. So like I said, Luke writes a, a, to a man named Theophilus, and he, he speaks about how he carefully investigated everything. He's acting as a historian. 
He's putting things into their historical context. He's saying this happened in the days of King Herod. This happened when uh, Caesar Augustus made the decree. This happened in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So he wants us to know this is not some sort of just spiritual thing. This is something that happened in real time and history. He also wants us to know that Jesus is the son of Adam and the son of God. It's interesting when Luke gives um, Jesus's family tree in Luke chapter three, he goes all the way back to Adam and he says he was the son of Adam, the son of God. And what Luke is doing is he's emphasizing that Jesus is a new kind of human being. He's a new Adam, a new representative for the human race. And just like Adam was tempted, Jesus is going to be tempted. Just as Adam represented us, so Jesus is going to represent us. But he's going to represent us by dying for us. Um, and Jesus is the one who's going to bring us back into paradise. Just as in Luke 23, Jesus says to the thief that is beside him on the cross, Truly I tell you that today you will be with me in paradise. The old Adam got us kicked out of paradise this new Adam is going to help us return to paradise. But Jesus is also portrayed as filled with the Spirit. As the new representative of all human beings, Jesus is the one who's walking by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon him as at his baptism, and as he goes out into his ministry, of course he's the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. But everything he's doing, he's doing in the power of the Spirit, united with the Holy Spirit, uh, rejoicing in the Spirit, it says in Luke chapter 10. He's a new kind of person. He's the kind of person who has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him and leading him, just as later he will give that same Spirit to us so that we can walk and be led by the Spirit of God. Um, one of the interesting uh, emphases of Luke is his emphasis on money. Uh, he talks a lot about wealth. He talks a lot about money. And he makes the point that you cannot serve God and money. Um, the poor are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God. The, the rich receive their, their reward in this life only, according to Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26. Riches are what choke out the seed of the gospel in the human heart in Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Our life is not measured by the worth of our possessions in Luke chapter 12. And then, of course, there is this this uh, rich young man who rejects Jesus because he has great possessions, while there is this poor widow woman who gives all that she has out of love for God when she drops that widow's mite in the offering box in the temple. And what Luke is showing us is that the, in the kingdom of God, there is a reversal that's taking place. The rich, the powerful, they are not the ones that are possessing God's kingdom. No, it is those who know they have nothing. It is the poor and the powerless. Um, another great emphasis in the book of Luke is that Jesus determines to journey to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, When the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. And then Luke spends 10 entire chapters of his gospel talking about the journey between Galilee and Jerusalem, even more than anything else that he talks about in the gospel. He wants his readers to know that Jesus going to Jerusalem to die was no accident. It was God's plan that Jesus set forth to obey voluntarily going to his sacrificial death. Finally, Jesus came to save sinners. One of the most beautiful things that is said in Luke, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, is that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And there are these parables that Jesus is like the shepherd who leaves the 99 to find the lost sheep. He's like the woman who searches for the lost coin. He's like the father who welcomes in the prodigal or the lost son in Luke chapter 15. He says in Luke chapter 5, verse 32, I've not come to call the righteous 
but sinners to repentance. He accepts a man like Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke, this tax collector who's cheated everyone. He has come to save even the Gentiles, not just the Jewish people, but even non-Jewish people. He's to be a light to the Gentiles. He's coming ultimately to suffer and die so that the entire world, all nations, can know the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. 